I'm going to carry on in the series I began last week called That Old Time Religion. And I've been trying to shed some new light on an old subject, and it's this old time gospel, and trying to show you how meaningful it is even today. And one of the things I've been doing as I've been going through it is I've been relating it to the vision of this church, which is to know God, live free, and find purpose. And so last week was ancient past, and I was, it was all about finding that ancient path that leads us to know God. And by the end of that message, we discovered what it was, that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that ancient path is actually Jesus Christ himself. And so today my message is entitled, Free Indeed. And uh, here's one of the things we know is that we were created to live free. If you look at the very beginning of the book, Go into the book of Genesis, go into the Garden of Eden. People were created to live free. Think about it. There was no sin, no sickness, no pain, no suffering, no death. Uh, no death. Uh, there was no anxiety. There was no worry. There was no mortgages. There was no clothes. There was, <laughs> I don't know if that's actually a good thing or not. You know, when Eve went to her closet and said, I don't have a thing to wear, she was being literal, right? <laughs> And uh, uh, I want to tell you a little story about this, because when I think about that part of the Garden of Eden, I think, I don't know if I really like that part, because I'll tell you what happened to me. When I was about seven years old, my dad was a member of this men's club, and he had to go down and pick something up out of his locker. And so we went to this club. We went down into the men's locker room. Here I am, seven years old, and I saw a sight I've never seen before, and that was a bunch of naked old men just walking around naked, sitting there, eating their lunch naked. They're all naked. And I mean, when you're only waist high, the last thing you want to do is come face to face with dingleberry surprise. You know, <laughs> yeah, I tell you, I think I've, I think I've been scarred for life from, 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 from this incident. And uh, you know, I couldn't, I never asked my dad what was going on. I didn't know why all these old men were naked. I think I figured it out. And here's what my seven-year-old brain decided. I thought, this is God's waiting room. They're down here waiting to die. And some of them are having their last meal. And you come into this world naked, so surely you have to leave that way. That was my seven-year-old conclusion. It's, it's like the story of Jerry. Jerry's a senior citizen. He wants to redecorate his house, but he has no money. So he tears down his curtains, and he throws them out, walks around his house naked for two days. The neighbors all picked in, bought him new curtains. <laughs> There's different ways of skinning a cat. So here's where I want to go today. The fact was we were created to live free. That is how we were made and designed to live. And yet we see after the fall in Genesis chapter 3, does it look like people are living free? When you read the narrative of the Old Testament, what we see is these people falling into bondage again and again into servanthood, into captivity. And every time they do, how many of you have noticed this, that their father in heaven comes and launches some heroic and radical rescue mission. Isn't that sort of the picture of the Old Testament? And then they no sooner get free, and then what happens? They're back into it again and again and again. And so I think that's a little bit of a picture of, of, the, of humanity. And I'm going to tell you a parable today. It's actually a true story. It happened to me. But I want to use it as a parable. And it's going to sort of set the stage for the rest of my message. So the time frame was this. It was October 1970. How many of you remember what happened? That was the October crisis in Canada. And there was an organization in Quebec called the FLQ, and they were the Quebec Liberation Front. And they were a radical terrorist, domestic terrorist group. There's no other way to describe what they did. And so in October of 1970, they kidnapped James Cross. He was a British diplomat. And they kidnapped Pierre Laporte. He was the uh, deputy premier of Quebec. And then they murdered. Uh, Pierre Laporte. It was a very dark time in, in Canadian history with this FLQ. The Prime Minister was Trudeau, uh, the, the father, Pierre Elliott, the, the smart one. And, uh, <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and, he, and he declared the War Measures Act. And we really have never had a time in Canada like happened in October of 1970. So that's the context of this story. Meanwhile, back in Winnipeg, I'm 12 years old. I'm almost 13. And uh, I'm with my brother. He's 10 at the time. And a Saturday afternoon, and we've run out of milk. And my father tells us, go down to the corner store. In those days, they had corner stores. Go down to the corner store and buy a jug of milk. And so he went and he found some change, a handful of quarters. And he gave me these quarters. He said, buy the milk. You boys can buy yourself a treat or something. You could buy a treat for 25 cents in those days. So I stuck those coins in my pocket. And we started walking down the lane. We got about halfway to the corner store. 
And we went by the Hayes brothers' house, and the Hayes brothers were teenagers. They were older than me. They, were, they had their bunch of friends over. Their dad had built a new fence, and they were using the old fence to build a fort in the backyard. And so me and my brother, we stopped, and we just stood there looking at this fort like this. And then, of course, one of them spotted us, and he says, what are you guys looking at? To which I said, I'm looking at your useless fort. E even then, I was sort of on the mouthy side. And my brother was even worse than me. He was, yeah, we're looking at your stupid fort. And so, so, so we're not off to a great start here. And uh, so we're looking at this, and I said, what are you going to do with it? And they said, we're the FLM. You get the reference, right, to the FLQ. They said, we're the FLM, and we're going to use our, our fort to take prisoners. To which my brother says, your stupid fort couldn't catch a mouse. And then they looked at each other with that look of, I think we found our first prisoners. <laughs> and they, and they never said anything, but we knew what that look meant. Me and my brother looked at each other, and we took off. They were teenagers. They were older than us. They chased us, and they caught us, and they dragged us back to their fort. And, uh, and then what they did, this is not a word of a lie. It was so stupid. They tied my brother to a tree. They tied my brother to a tree, and then they took me, and they tied my, my feet up to a rope, they threw the rope over a tree limb, and they hung me upside down by my feet. And it's a bad story, Mom, I know. And, <laughs> and so these guys actually didn't, they actually didn't hurt us, but they did scare us, and they did torment us uh, for about half an hour. This is what it was like growing up in the 60s. People ran around the streets like a pack of dogs. Some of you remember this. Where were the parents? Who knows? So anyway, this went on for about half an hour. They got sick of us, and they released us from their prison. And so I went, we were going to head down to the store. I stuck my hand in my pocket, and the change was gone. And see, when I was hanging upside down, it must have fallen out into the grass. I'm not going back into the prison. So we went home empty-handed. My dad is reading the newspaper. And he drops a newspaper like this, and he says, where's the milk? I said, we got mugged. <laughs> he says, he doesn't believe me. He says, you got mugged? My little brother says, it's more like a kidnapping. <laughs> and he says, you got mugged? or kidnapped, which one was it? He totally doesn't believe us. I said, kind of both. We kind of got mugged and kidnapped. And he says, who mugged and kidnapped you? I said, it was the FLM. <laughs> and he says, who's the FLM? So anyway, I tell him the story about what happened. And as soon as he finds out what actually happened, he snaps. He absolutely snaps, and he jumps up, and he grabs the two of us, and we walk down the street to the Hayes brothers' house. They saw us coming, but now the shoe was on the other foot, because I had my father with me. That's how you settled stuff in those days. You didn't call the cops. You had your dad beat up somebody else's dad. That's how you did it. <laughs> And so, so, we, so these kids bolt into the house. They go in the house. They close the door. My dad and I, we're standing right with them. And he knocks on the door. And they don't come to the door. The father comes to the door. He says, where are those boys of yours? Everybody knows who they are. They're the ones with the prison down the street. And he says, where are those boys of yours? And so the boys come out, and they're cowering behind their dad like this. And my dad says, if you ever touch my boys again, you will not be the FLM. You will be the F-L-A-T. Do you understand? <laughs> My dad threatened them. It was so good. And <laughs> so then we went back home, and that was the end of the story. And you know, I lived to tell about it, right? But here, here's what I want to I want to ask you a couple of questions. Let's, let's let this story serve as a bit of a parable, parable today. And my first question for you is this. Were those boys, were they bullies? Why, why are you struggling with this? I had someone last night said, no. Yes, they, they, by, by any definition, they were bullies. They were tormenting us. They, they kidnapped us. They mugged us. Were you listening? So these guys were bullies. Now my father, on the other hand, did he launch a heroic rescue mission? Did he defend us? Yes, he defended us. Now here's the point. Here's where I'm going with this. Was there any small level of responsibility or culpability on my part. Yes. yes, I was the guy lipping them off. I could have walked by. 
but I don't ever walk by, do I? <laughs> you, you know me, if I see something, I want people to know what I feel about it, and I share it with it. And see, I think this is a picture for us, is that we go through life, we have this, on one side we have the devil, right? And the devil is a bad devil, and he's got all kinds of schemes against you to enslave you and imprison you in life. And on the other side, we have a great God who loves you, he's your father, and he will always defend you. But the problem isn't either one of these. Well, it's the fact that we tend to walk into these situations where the devil takes advantage of us. Don't think for a moment that you are some hapless victim and have no sense of responsibility or culpability in this. You do. And we end up in bondage in this life because we step into it. Instead of siding with our father all the time, we drift over the other way. And you know, I think when it comes to the old time gospel, the old time religion, I think it gets a bit of a bum rap because people think religion is what oppresses people, right? That's what they think. They think it's just a bunch of rules and regulations that puts people into bondage. That was never the intent. This is what Jesus said. It says, he came to set the captives free. We have thousands of years of oppression and Jesus came to set the captives free and he said, he who the son sets free is free indeed. So I want to look at the old time religion. I want to look at the Old Testament. And I'm going to show you, and there's going to be a picture emerge from this, that you will see that, in fact, the Bible has always spoken about us living free. And so here we are. We're in uh, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6, and this is what it says. It says, is this the fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day of the Lord? Understand this, that he is speaking rhetorically, sarcastically. This is not what he wants. Look at the next verse. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? When you look at the first verse in this, that sounds like a little bit of the religion of the Pharisees, doesn't it? You know, walking through the streets, sackcloth and ashes, all sad and dour and sour. And he says, that's not what I'm looking for from you. He says, I want freedom from you. I want you to break every yoke. I want you to get free. And there's three words that I pointed out on the screen here that I, that I capitalized. And, the, and there was, the first one was this. It was loose. The second one was undo. The third one was break. And those words all kind of sound similar on one level. I mean, loose and undo, they all sound the same. And if you were able to study them out in the Hebrew language, which I did, you'll actually see there's a bit of a progression. And each one of those words becomes stronger than the one before it. And I'd like to sort of redefine them and, and, and say this. The first one is like loosen. The second one is to shake off. And the third one is to cast away or break or destroy completely. And each one of those words is progressively. See, see if, you were, if you were to get tied up and you had to get out of that, that bond, what would you do? The first thing you have to do is loosen it, right? And then you have to shake it off and then you have to cast it away. That's how you get free. That's how Tom Cruise would do it, right? In Mission Impossible as Ethan Hunt. I mean, think about this. How many of you have seen a few Mission Impossibles? How many Mission Impossible movies does he get captured? In how many of them? Every single one of them. And in how many of them does he get away? Every one of them. And how does he do it? I'll tell you how he does it. A paper clip. All he needs is a paper clip. And it doesn't matter how severe the bondage is, he's getting away. If only he had a paper clip. So it would probably be wise for me to show you a clip from Mission Impossible 3. And in this one, he is bound hand and foot. He's even got a mask on him like Hannibal Lecter. There is no way he's getting out of this. So, but let's time it just in case he does get away. And so here it is, throw it up on the screen. Here you go. So there he is, oh look at that. He is not getting out of this one, people. Unless he has a paper clip. Oh, he's got a hand loose. Oh, he's beating some guys up. Oh, there's the rest of it, he's taking them off. Oh, yep, yep, doing good, doing good. Yep. Oh, that's got hurt. There's the last one, cast it away, and he's free. 28 seconds. 28 seconds? 
with a paper clip. Did you see the progression? First of all, he had to loosen that one arm, right? Then he had to start beating, beating the other guys up while he was shaking off the other shackles. Finally, he had to take the mask and cast it away while he carefully threw the phone and perfectly hit the stop button on the elevator. It's amazing. All the while beating up three guys. And he did it in 26 seconds, the same way you have to get free. He gets free in 26 seconds. How come you've been in bondage 28 years? I'll tell you why. You don't have a paper clip. That's why. And you see, there's a big difference. You see, this is mission impossible. This is not real life. In Mission Impossible, it's ridiculous. It's not supposed to work. It's impossible, but he makes it happen. That's entertaining. You don't live in Mission Impossible. You live in Mission Difficult. And mission difficulty is way harder. You know why? Because it's real life, right? I mean, you know, we're never going to be handcuffed. Most of us, a few of you have already had that, but most of you are never going to be handcuffed. But how many times have we been in bondage to things like drugs or alcohol or tobacco or pornography or now this stupid vaping thing that's killing people? And we have so many bondages in our life. You might never go to prison, but you know what? People are in prison to depression and discouragement and unforgiveness and bitterness and the list goes on and on and on. And you might never be a slave. I hope you never are. But the scripture says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. And probably every one of you in here knows what it's like to be a slave to debt. And so there's all kinds of bondages around us and I'm not gonna spend very much time on those things. I wanna talk about how we actually get free of these things. And we just have to look at the pattern that Ethan Hunt gives us and we need to loosen and we need to shake off and we need to cast away. And so let's look at the first one. The first one is this. And it's to loosen the bonds of wickedness. And see, you're never going to be able to loosen off those bonds or those chains or those handcuffs. You're never going to be able to loosen wickedness if you don't first recognize wickedness for what it is. Now, I know that everybody in this room would know The Wizard of Oz. You all know The Wizard of Oz? And in 2003, Broadway produced a play. It was a musical called Wicked. And Wicked wasn't about The Wizard of Oz. It was the prequel to The Wizard of Oz. And uh, it was the story of how the Wicked Witch of the West became wicked. And so it was on Broadway for a number of years, came to Winnipeg, Kathy wanted to go see it. So uh, we went to see it and it was a, actually a very entertaining show. It was captivating, good music. And uh, so we're gonna learn how the Wicked Witch of the West became wicked about a third of the way through the show. They, they dropped the bomb that the Wicked Witch of the West wasn't really wicked she was just misunderstood. <laughs> and she, she was a victim of her upbringing. Now, I was the only one in the whole room that cracked up. I thought that was hilarious. I thought they were joking. And I'm cracking up. I'm the only one laughing. Kathy says, why are you laughing? I said, that's so funny. She's not wicked. She's misunderstood. I mean, you try going through high school with warts and green skin. See how you turn out. And I thought, what a ridiculous concept to think that people are not wicked, but they're misunderstood. I mean, that's like saying that Hitler was not wicked. He was just misunderstood. Mussolini wasn't wicked. He was just misunderstood. Pol Pot wasn't wicked. He was just misunderstood. Martha Stewart wasn't wicked. Well, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I've gone too far. <laughs> but you get, you get my point. We can't just say people are, are misunderstood. Wicked is wicked, and we need to recognize it. You'll never get free if you don't recognize evil when it comes knocking on your door. Now I want to tell you a little story from history that most of you know the ending, most of you know most of the story, but we often forget the beginning of this story and I'm going to tell you the beginning. And so in 1938 there was a leader in Europe who was very captivating, very charismatic, people were following, people were adoring this person and in 1938 Time Magazine named him Man of the Year. Some of you have guessed we're talking about Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler in 1938 was man of the year. Uh, remember, they weren't necessarily endorsing him. He was the newsmaker of the year. But at this point, there had been no war, no Holocaust, no genocide, no atrocities had taken place. And there was merely this captivating leader in Europe that the German people basically fell in love with and were following him. So then the first thing he did was this. There was going to be a referendum in Austria, and they were going to decide whether they were going to join Germany. He canceled the referendum and annexed them without their saying, just took over 
Austria. And then his plan after that was to go into the Czech Republic and take the Czech Republic because there was many German-speaking people over there. And there was a, a prime minister in Britain by the name of Neville Chamberlain, and he looked at this thing, and people were worried that there was going to be war. They had just come out of the First World War. They didn't want to go back into another one 20 years later. And so Chamberlain traveled to Munich, and he sat down with Hitler, and he said to Hitler, what is it that you want? Tell me what you want, and maybe we can resolve this. So Hitler said, what I want is I want all the German-speaking areas of a Western Czech Republic called Sunderland. He said, that's what I want, and if, and if they'll give me that, then we don't have to settle this with war. So Chamberlain agreed to it, you ready for this? Without consulting the Czech people. He gave them Western Czech Republic, he gave them Sunderland, and he came back to England, and he made this declaration, and some of you will remember this from your history, he said, we have peace in our day. And uh, he was lauded as this hero. It was called the appeasement plan. And, his, and his, his solution was this. We don't need to have war. We don't need to fight this guy. All we need to do is we just need to give him what he wants and everything will be fine. There was a backbencher in the British Parliament who actually hadn't been in cabinet for years and years and years. Maybe some of you know his name. He was Winston Churchill. And he was not serving in cabinet. He was in what was called the wilderness years of his career. And he stood up and he railed against this. And he said, you are so wrong. He called Hitler a bully. He called him a thug and a gangster. He eventually referred to him as the mainspring of evil in the world. And he warned the British people, he warned the world that if we didn't stop the strong man, we were going to end up in what he called an unnecessary war. And he was the lone voice that was recognizing the evil of this man. And so then what happened, make a long story short, Hitler goes in, he doesn't take Western Czech Republic, he takes the whole thing. And then he goes into Slovenia and he takes that whole thing. And then he goes into Poland and he takes all that. And then he goes into Hungary and he takes all that. And then of course, by 1939, we were in a full-blown world war in Europe. And then of course, Neville Chamberlain had to resign in disgrace and guess who took his place? Winston Churchill rose because he was the only one that really truly recognized the evil that was going on. And see, here's a little bit of a picture that I don't want you to miss. We live in a culture today where people do not recognize the works of evil for what they are. And if you don't recognize them, if you don't stop it and nip it in the bud, see, we don't ever have to end up in bondage. We don't ever have to be oppressed. But if we don't recognize the grip of wickedness in the world, we're in so much trouble. And the scripture is so clear about this. The old time religion is so clear about this that the one thing that enslaves people is sin. It says whoever sins is a slave to sin. And so all bondage actually comes from sin, either our sin or the sin of others. And here's what the old time religion was all about was the old-time religion, old-time gospel preachers, they used to warn people about sin. They used to warn about the dangers and the snares of sin, and they used to talk about these things from the pulpit. And I'll uh, give you a couple of examples. The most famous sermon in history was 1741, and it was by a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards, and his sermon was called, catch this catchy title, it was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And uh, then this book is, is sort of fascinating because it has a little extra there. It's got Charles Spurgeon's uh, sermon, Turn or Burn. I've read this sermon. There are no jokes and stories in it. <laughs> I, I wouldn't preach this sermon. But when Jonathan Edwards preached this sermon, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people came to Christ and fell down and repented. Why? Because he warned them of the threat of sin. Now, contrast that with what goes on in churches today. People don't actually talk about sin very much because it's uncomfortable. You know, there, there was an interview being done with the pastor of the largest church in North America. I'm not going to mention his name, but he looks like Howdy Doody. And uh, he was being interviewed, and this interviewer asked him this question. And he said, I noticed, pastor, that you never use the word sin in your sermons. Why is it that you don't use that word? And he said, that's correct. I don't use that word. And, they, and he said, why not? He says, I don't use the word because I think people know when they're not doing right. My question for you is, is that true? Do people know when they're not doing right? They don't actually know. People in our culture today do not know right from wrong. How would they? 
Abraham Lincoln once said this, referring to the Bible. He said, this book is the greatest gift that God has given to man, for without it we would not know right from wrong. Is that true? How would we know right from wrong? I'm gonna, <laughs> there's a couple of people at the back that get it. I'm going to illustrate this with a story happened to me. Uh, I, I was sharing the gospel. I was having coffee with this guy. And he gave me the opportunity, asked me some questions about the gospel, and I just went in. Boom. I saw the opening. Boom. In I went. And so I went, and I'm sharing the gospel with him, and I am telling him all about the glorious work of the cross and what Jesus did and how he died for his sin and how he saved him from this. And I was doing, let me just be immodest here for a moment, an amazing job. It was almost like I was a professional, and I could, I could do this and explain the gospel to him. So I went about 20, 25 minutes, explained the gospel to him, and then I said to him, he just sat there listening. And I said, do you have any questions? <laughs> this is what he said. He said, yes, I have one. I said, what is it? He says, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? What part don't you understand? He says, the sin part. Why do you keep talking about sin? You keep mentioning that word. He says, I know, I've heard the word sin, but he says, to be honest with you, I don't really know what that means. I don't really know what a sin is. What is this sin you're talking about? I'm thinking, this is the world we live in now. People literally don't know what it was. So I thought, hey, I, I remember I'm the preacher? I thought I have a good description of it. I said, here's what sin is. Sin is merely this. Anything you do that disappoints God. And then he said this to me. He said, how would I know what was going to disappoint God? Is that a fair question? That's a fair question. How would he know? How would he know? And I'm sitting there, the preacher, having trouble explaining to this guy what sin is, because he doesn't have the foggiest clue. And then all of a sudden came to me. I said, you know what a good start would be? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments would be a pretty good start. That's the old-time religion, right? That's that old-time gospel about what is right and wrong, and it's still God's standard was right and wrong. And I know people say, whoa, 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 pastor, that's Old Testament. That stuff's been abolished. It's been abolished? Is that what the scripture says? Did Jesus not say, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it? And my question for you would be this. Which one of the Ten Commandments exactly has he abolished? Is it that murder one? Did he, abol he abolish that one, the murder one? Just remind me. Is that one abolished? How about, the, how about the, you know, the stealing one? Has he abolished that one? How about the lying one? Has he abolished that one? How about the adultery one? Has that one been abolished? Oh, maybe. <laughs> I mean, that's what people think, right? It's like the story of when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and he says to the people of Israel, I've got some good news and bad news. They said, what's the good news? He says, the good news is I got them down to 10. The bad news is adultery is still one of them. <laughs> it's just how the world thinks, right? So here's the first thing. We've got to loosen the bonds of wickedness. We're going to have to recognize evil for what it is. We're going to have to call sin, sin. We're going to have to call wrong, wrong, and right, right. But we live in a world that calls right, wrong, and wrong, right. Am I right? Or am I wrong? <laughs> you can think about that. So the first one is this, it's loosened. The second one is this, is, is you have to shake it off. And so here's the verse from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us so that we may run the race that is set before us. And the illustration that the writer is using there is an athletic one. Even back in the time of the Bible, they had athletic competitions. They were actually very big, the Greek Olympics, all those things. And he says, if you're going to run in a race, you're going to have to lay aside the weights, the things that slow you down. Now, some of you are athletes, and so you know this, that you might go into training, and you actually might add weight onto your training regimen. You actually might wear ankle weights when you're skating in, in hockey, but when the game comes, you take off the weight. You might actually have the runners have these packs. They're like vests that are full of weights, and they will run with these weights. But on race day, what do they do? They lay aside every weight that slows them down or ensnares them. That's why the runners, they run in outfits like this. It's like skin tight. They're almost like they have nothing on. Any encumbrance of wind or hair or anything in the way, they, they strip it all down so that they can run the race unencumbered. And I don't know if you know much about the Tour de France. The Tour de France bike is made out of carbon fiber, and it weighs less than three pounds. You can pick it up with one finger like this. Why? Because there's no reason to carry this excessive weight for hundreds of kilometers through Europe, right? And so what we have is this metaphor is that what you have to do is you have to lay aside every weight and sin. 
Now, I just explained to you what sin is. Sin we know is sin. And those are the things that you've got to get rid of because they're going to bog you down. But he didn't just leave it there. He said, also weights. See, sins are things that are actually wrong. Weights are things that aren't necessarily wrong, but are not necessarily helpful. And see, we have both in our life. We have things that are just plain wrong, and we have other things that are actually just really unhelpful. And what we have to do is we have to let go of those things. We've got to let go of these weights, these things that encumber us. And that's why we get bogged down in life, because we're carrying around these burdens and these weights. He says, undo the heavy burdens. Let me use Paul the Apostle as an example. I mean, Paul the Apostle, he was formerly Saul of Tarsus. He's a pretty bad dude. I've told you this before. Killing Christians, persecuting the church. He comes to Christ. Did he have anything he had to live down? I mean, he had a lot to live down. He was this persecutor. He was this guy that was against the church, and now he's part of it. He went from chief of sinners to chief of the apostles, and they, he comes into a church. Well, they're not sure they even want to trust them. My question is this. How did he do that? How did he overcome these things? He tells us. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in Jesus Christ. He said, that old man that you knew, Saul of Tarsus, he's dead because he was crucified with Christ. I have shaken him off. So much so that he even gave himself a new name. He changed his name from Saul to Paul. Why? Because he was no longer that person he used to be. And so many of us have some things in our past that hold us back, things that are, are, are things that make you feel guilty and shame and regret. We all have those things. And we have to get rid of those things. That's why Paul puts it this way in Philippians chapter 3. He says, not that I have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which lay behind. He says, I am shaking them off and I am leaving them behind. He says, I can't look at my past any longer. Do you know that he had the nerve in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 to say this? He said, I have wronged no man. How could he say that? Because it is no longer he who lives. He has been crucified with Christ. He has got rid of the weights and sins that so easily ensnare, and he is forgetting the things which are behind. How many of you notice when you buy a car, it's got this great big huge windshield on the front and a little tiny rear view mirror. Why is the windshield so much bigger than the rear view mirror? Could it be that you're supposed to spend more time looking forward than backwards? I think that's a good example. You can't be going through life looking backwards. If you do, you're in trouble. Isn't that what happened to Lot's wife? She came out of Sodom and Gomorrah. She looked back. What happened? Turned into a pillar of salt. Little Johnny was in Sunday school. The teacher was telling that very story and said, look what happened to Lot's wife. She looked back, turned into a pillar of salt. Little Johnny said, that's nothing. On the way to church this morning, my mother looked back, turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're getting this? this uh, we, have to lay a, uh, we, we have to lay aside, we have to shake off those things of our past let me give you just one illustration about this. So in 1980, there was a man by the name of Dwayne McKinney. And Dwayne was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was only 21 years old. And he was at a Burger King. And the Burger King got robbed and the manager got murdered. And Dwayne got arrested and convicted of that crime and sent to prison, a crime he did not commit. He narrowly avoided the death penalty. And he spent 18 years in prison. And after 18 years, the person who actually committed that crime was actually serving another sentence in the same prison. And he confessed to that crime after 18 years. And they, had, they let Dwayne McKinney go, and all of a sudden he's free from a crime he didn't have anything to do with, but he spent 18 years of his life. And so they were interviewing him, and they said, are you bitter towards that man who kept that a secret for 18 years? He says, no, I'm not bitter, and let me tell you why. He said, a lot of good things happened to me in prison. And the main thing that was good was I came to Christ and I learned how to forgive and I learned how to let go of my past. And he says, don't miss this. He says, I have lost 18 years of my life. I'm not going to lose the next 18 years of it reliving it. You see, he understood that you have to shake it off. You have to lay it aside so that you can move forward. 
So the first thing is you need to loosen the grip. The second thing is you need to shake it off. And the third and the final thing is this, is that you need to cast it away. Break every yoke, discard every yoke, crush it. Have it in such a way that it no longer has a hold over you. So, you know, here's what people think. They think that freedom in this world is being able to do whatever you want. Isn't that sort of the definition of freedom today? Just let me do whatever I want. If it feels good, do it. If it makes me happy, I want to do it. And so people go through life just doing whatever they want. Nothing puts you in bondage more than doing whatever you want. Because what you do is you become a patsy, a sucker for the devil, and he will just suck you right in. You ask, ask any uh, you know, addict, any person with a sexual addiction, anybody addicted to pornography, you do whatever you want, and you know where this path will lead. So in the scripture, we have a story. I'll close with this. In the scripture, we have a story of a man in the gospel who was more bound than any other person, I think, anywhere in the whole of scripture. And his name, we call him the Madman of Gadara. And he lived in this region of Gadara. And uh, here's what he did. He, uh, he stayed up all night. He ran around naked. He screamed like a banshee. Uh, he was free. I mean, he didn't work. He didn't have a job, didn't have bills to play, pay. He could do whatever he wanted. I mean, by today's standards, he was free, right? Kept, keep, he, he was free to keep you up all night, screaming like a wild man. They says they could not bind him even with chains. And Jesus goes on this mission, a rescue mission, and he goes to see the madman of Gadara. And this man is more bound than any other human being. And the story tells us that he not only had a demon, he had a legion of demons. And Jesus cast the demons out. Do you remember what he did with them? He cast them out and into the herd of swine. And then the herd of the swine, they, they ran to the edge of a cliff and fell into the sea and they drowned. You say, what was that all about? I'll tell you what. What Jesus was trying to do was to communicate to that man that he was free. So much so that those things that ensnared him were not only cast away, but they were cast into the sea, never to be remembered. And I don't think you can drown demons. But the picture, the imagery is what is so important, that this man would know that the thing that bound him was now gone and cast away. Now, here's my question. Do you think there was a backstory to the man band of Gadara? Do you think that somewhere along the line, there was a path that got him to where he was? running around screaming naked and cutting himself with rocks. There was definitely, we don't know what it is, it doesn't tell us, but we know there's always a backstory. There's always some bad choices that were made way back then that got him here and Jesus came along and Jesus set him free and he wants to set you free. It doesn't matter what your level of bondage is, we all have something. We all have something that we wrestle with. None of us are really truly living free and that's his desire for us. And we're going to have to loosen the grip of wickedness. We're going to have to shake off the heavy burdens. We're going to have to cast away everything that clings to us and recognize this, that Jesus said, the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy, that I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly for he who the Son sets free is free indeed. I am free. I'm free. Thank God Almighty. I am free at last. That's how you live free. Let's stand together, shall we? All right, we're going to do a couple of things. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We did this a couple of months ago. We're going to do it again. And uh, with every head bowed, every eye closed. And I just want you to take a moment and just think about what are the weights and sins that are hanging on you. They might not be wrong. They just might be unhelpful. What are those things? What are the things you need to loosen, shake off, and cast away? What are the things you need to discard permanently from your life? That's my question for you. And I want you to just think about that because I think what God wants for us more than anything else is he wants us to not just get free, but to live free and stay free. And that is his will for us. And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to ask a second question. There might be somebody, some in this room here today, and I'm sure there is, and that you've actually never taken the first step of inviting Christ into your life to be your Lord and Savior. You've never actually dealt with the initial sin problem that you have fallen short of the glory of God, and Jesus died on the cross for your sin, and if you haven't invited him to your life, you haven't taken the first step. And if you're in that category, then you will not be sure if you're on your way to heaven or not. 
And I'm not going to single you out or call you forward. But if that's you, and you've never invited Christ into your life, or maybe you have in the past and you slipped away, I'm not going to call you forward, but I want you to sl slip up your hand. Just identify yourself by raising your hand. Thank you, thank you. This hand's popping up around the room. Anybody else want to join these folks? Not going to call you forward, not singling you out. All right, you can all put your hands down. And we're all going to pray together because I think we all have a part in this. So let's all pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the work of the cross. That yet, while I was still a sinner, you loved me enough to die for me. And you want me to live free and to lay aside every sin and every weight that ensnares me. And I thank you that that's what the cross does. It takes them all away. It casts away my sin as far as the east is from the west. And I thank you that today, this day, I am free because you died for my sins. You rose again on the third day and you forever live to be my Lord so that I might be free Free indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand, shall we? Give him a shout.